Welcome to the Startup Showcase. I'm your host, Scott Katoon, and this is Technory Live from WGN Radio, where Chicago's top tech founders and entrepreneurs come to share their story. Joining me, Brad, is it Weisberg? Yeah. Yes! Okay. I'm Got it. for two today. You would think that this would be easy. It is not easy. Sure it's not. I don't know how to, like, I can't read names. Uh, Snapsheet, I can definitely get, though. That's not that's not above uh, above or below my reading ability. Uh, welcome to the show, for starters. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so you have had quite a busy year, it sounds I've had quite a busy seven years. Well, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> but I've I've seen your name and and Snapsheet in the news on like a very consistent basis uh, yeah. uh, throughout at least the last three months. It's been like seems like fairly every day basically. Yeah. So yeah. I guess uh, before we kind of jump into things and learn a little bit more about you and how the business is built and how you've stayed busy for seven years, uh, why don't you just give us kind of a quick rundown of what Snapsheet is? Sure. So uh, Snapsheet offers virtual claims processing. I know it's super sexy. Yeah, uh, I was just gonna, in my for, mind, I was about to be like, yeah, wow, wow, that's the sexiest that's, thing I've ever heard. Yeah, right, for um, auto insurance carriers. So oh, nice. you know, essentially what we do is like we'll go into – um, you know, uh, uh, an insurance company, and we will help. We give them a platform and a way to process their claims by photo, virtually, and centralized. So uh, you used to actually send somebody to uh, your car to actually write an estimate at your house, and now you can do it all by photo. This is almost as sexy as, as Rothman when he came in to talk about SMS Assist. Yes, he's right. Like, he's like, listen, on paper, it's worth a few billion bucks, which makes it real sexy. sexy right. Come into our office. Yeah, not, not sexy. So much, yeah. Not sexy. Uh, so this is cool, though, because it actually, you know, all joking aside, it is actually a big deal because uh, that is a pain in the ass. Yeah. And that's a, a very expensive task. I mean, you yeah. had to send out. There's so many different holes in that system, as you obviously yeah. know and have perfected for the most part. Uh, the holes in the system as a person who did have numerous random car accidents, say, falling asleep on the way to work in the morning. No uh, way. Oh, this happened a bunch of times. Like <laughs> A bunch of times. Oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, it's I don't mean what, like full speed. Do you I don't have mean to be full here? Because it's, no, no, like, this, it's this like is, this is your, so I used to work, three in the afternoon? I used to work, in, uh, and they're probably listening, so I, I apologize ahead of time, but I used to work uh, for some family members out in Lake Forest in, in commercial real estate. Yeah. And to say mildly, I did not enjoy my job. Um, and so I, I live in Glen Ellen and it was like four, so it was like an hour and a half commute, no matter which way you cut it. And so I would try to leave at like five 30 in the morning thereabouts. So I can get there like 45 minutes and get ahead early on the schedule. Well, I was a young guy, you know, I'm, I graduated college in 2006. So I was like 22, three, four, five. I was going out every night, just getting hammered. And then I'd right. get up on Thursday and drive to work and you're like, I'm barely. Yeah, you're like, not there. Yeah, right. I'm barely functional. I wasn't falling asleep. Just so we're clear, I wasn't falling asleep like dr- cruising down the highway. This right. would be like I get at a stoplight and I'd fall asleep. Put it in park. You know, not even that. I, I'd just fall seconds, asleep. Close your eyes. I'd fall asleep, but I'd wake up to like the crest of a bumper touch. <laughs> it's not funny, so but yes, it's funny. That would be a perfect use for our product. Exactly. It's right there. Yeah. Exactly. So like, what ended up happening? This happened a couple times, literally. And so they would send. So now I'm in Lake Forest. There's. I need an estimate on my car. I need an estimate on their car. I need whatever. Do I have them come to my office where I'm going to be here for a while, or do I have them come to Glen Ellen? Now they've got to send there, and I'm trying to like you know You're planning it out days ahead of time, right? Yeah, it's you stupid. You don't have to do any of that anymore. Yeah, exactly. It's stupid. But the only the one question I had for you in this though is, <clears throat> this is going to sound real shady. Uh, I I would have random incidents with the car, right? So I would think like, all right, if I like kiss the bumper of this one guy, and and so now the bumper's a little dented here, but like six seven inches away, there's a scratch from something else that I may have done i used to be able to be like hey that all happened happens today all the time yeah i was that all guy all the time yeah and 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 i in my mind i was a great con man so like if i had a one on if i got you in a room with me trust me i didn't you care if it was the me front well maybe not that now not you maybe but <laughs> the front bumper and the back bumper i could somehow convince you that they're related yeah and these people are like i don't know well okay and they'd write it up and leave and i'm like yeah right now you've got this and i feel like i'm probably shit out of luck is what i'm feeling well like. so you're not shit out of luck, but I mean, essentially, like we have a a team of estimators. We've got hundreds of them on staff, where their job is to look at the photos and actually take the facts of loss, like the things that yeah. happened in the repair or in the wreck, and make sure that you're not doing that. Yeah. So like, we have people trained to look for people that are trying people to people like me. <laughs> it's called like light fraud. Yeah. This and, is, but this it's is. but it's like it's like, expensive for carriers. I mean, like their job, like insurance companies want to pay to get your car back on the road and like to pre accident conditions. And the you know the way that they lose money is by fraud. is 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 stuff like that. And so like you know we have built software and we have people to to try to minimize well, that and as so much like, as possible. That's the thing. And I, used to, I actually it's funny you said that because I used to call it junior fraud. Yeah. It's like a little little baby Madoff going right. on here. Yeah. Um. But but the truth of the matter is there's it's a huge amount of money that yeah. gets lost. And huge. we used to talk Billions. about it in, in retail with, with when I was working commercial real estate when I was awake. Uh. We would negotiate 
a lot of different insurance rates and things because these these spaces were some of them were not in the greatest parts of town. Right. And so shrinkage was really high in a lot of these areas. And it was like, well, are you responsible? Because security's not taking care of things. They would literally call and be like, dude, we have like epic, like city trends is losing like 20% of their inventory on a week over week basis wow. here. It's insane. So like, what are you going to do about it? That's a, a, a mon- the amount of money that they can save or make, however you want to look at it, yeah. a, a company by simply minimizing the stuff that falls down the hole mm-hmm. is an insane amount of money. Yes. Right. And you've obviously found That's what we a, do. a perfect niche yes. on covering that <clears throat> manhole. Yeah. We, we, like, we really help carriers control the accuracy of the estimates, which is called actually leakage. Yeah. It's where an estimator would like overwrite an estimate or underwrite an estimate. Yeah. So we actually, we, our software makes it, they, you get the exact same estimate every single time. And then we, we just create a much better user experience. So you don't have to actually drive to a body shop. You don't have to um, wait for someone to come to your house. We literally just text you. Which is also time and money on that side, too. I mean, oh, we yeah. talked about, obviously, the, the most obvious part, but then you also had to pay human beings to be in commute and oh, yeah. track them, and they were driving all over the hell. You yeah, know? and if your car is wrecked to the point where you need a rental, it helps reduce like the, the cycle time, the time that you're actually in a rental car. So well. now you're talking about actually making it a better experience overall. So this is this is quite yeah. – quite. there's a reason that you're in the news all the time. Is yeah, what you're saying. Oh, we're getting so there. So what, what was the background for you? How did you get into this? So uh, I had no insurance experience. I had no auto experience. Not I, even light fraud. Not even light fraud. No, okay. no. No. Uh, no junior but, fraud. <laughs> no junior fraud, right. Uh, I, honestly, I just went through a really like painful, awful experience of like getting in a car wreck myself. And I took my car to three different body shops and I got three completely different estimates for the exact same dent. And it was just super frustrating. It was time consuming. It made absolutely no sense to me at all. And so, of course, uh, having an entrepreneurial mindset, you think you can change the world uh, by yourself. So I decided to take out essentially my life savings and start a company. And the original idea was called Body Shop Bids. It had absolutely nothing to do with insurance. But I literally just you know, curated a network of body shops. Anyone could submit photos of their car and you get three estimates within 24 hours and you could book an appointment with the body shop and do it all online. And it, it worked well. I raised some uh, venture capital for that idea, but we really quickly learned that 90% of people that get their car repaired are actually going through insurance. Yeah. And they have millions of people every single year that need to get an estimate on their vehicle, and they have no like self-service, white-glove way to do this. So we pivoted the company in 2012, changed the name to Snapsheet, and started building like workflow management tools and offering solutions, point solutions for carriers. Found that scalable moment where it's yes. like, you know, this is one thing we can run around and rack it up, and for a minute it looks cool, but then you realize if we want to actually scale and raise real right. capital. If, yes, if, if we're trying to, uh, to build a real business, then yeah. we, need to, we need to understand what the market is asking for and kind of change our model to fit it. And yeah, that's what we did. It sounds like that. So if, if you don't mind, I'm going to see certain things. If you can't get into it, you know, just whatever, just ignore it and poke me or something and throw, throw, this, throw your water bottle at me. Um, how did you guys handle the rebranding? Because I feel like, you know, we talked to a lot of a lot of companies and startups that come in here, some of them way past startup, um, <clears throat> that handle rebranding differently, I guess you'll say. They call it, you know, they have a pivot. And it's like, we yeah. want to do all this stuff. And it's like the bidding logo probably doesn't really work for insurers no, and right. they like hated that's it. Told, they, actually, yeah. they told us they were like, like yeah, we're not going to do it. doesn't show this. confidence to our customers. Yeah, so, well, yeah, yeah, it's not assured. Right. It's, it's, yeah. Bit, right. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's not going to work. So how did you, one, uh, there's two sides to this uh, that I'm trying to get at from you. From the business side of it, how did you as a business turn the ship and be like, all right, we're going to change this. We're going to be Snapsheet. We're going to operate in these areas and core competencies are going to kind of shift and we're going to take some good from this and dump some of these things and whatever. That's the business side. On the personal side, this is something you built and you bled into it. And you've got people, I assume at this point, that have now bought into you. And you're telling them, we were going a thousand miles in action in that direction. And now we're going to hit the brakes and boop, yeah. over here. How, how did so, you manage that? It's, it's probably not as deep as you might think it was. I mean, I was... Uh, like I would eat, sleep, and breathe body shop bids. I mean, like yeah. that was my baby. That was name. my idea. Like yeah, it was, it was awesome. Right? Can we yeah. revive it as a right. calendar. Yeah, and but so you go out and you spend a lot of time doing research and just pouring everything you have into this. You've raised some some venture capital, and now you've got other people betting on you. Um, but it's like if you're the unit economics don't work, and you're all of a sudden halfway through your money, and you know something's not working, you kind of get to that like oh crap moment where it's like okay, if I keep going down this path, I'm going to run out, and my dream is going to be over. Yep. So you know, I think one thing that I'm good at is I'm I'm, I'm pretty humble, and I'm not really that set my ways like I can, I can always be swayed by a yeah. better idea you know I'm always thinking like there's got to be a better way to do this so 
um, I'm always looking and I'm always open for it. And you know, one thing we used to do is we would go to a lot of body shop conferences and insurance conferences just to network and get out there and understand um, the needs in the industry. And it was honestly like the market was just telling us. I mean, it was just very clear that that the model I had, which was like a, a business to consumer product where you get in a car wreck once every seven to 10 years, and there's no repeat business. And I'm yeah. spending all my money on marketing. And yet all I'm really trying to do is get customers at a time when they need an estimate and there's 30 million people a year that need estimates on their vehicle from insurance it, it really it, it, like it's certainly obvious when, it, you, when yes. you put it that way it's very obvious yes but it was hard i mean yeah. like it, it took it took time for me to really like wrap my head around it and say okay i'm now like shutting this off how did you call with snap sheet is like the branding. so yeah and so uh also um not an amazing story, but uh, we, there was like so glad there I was maybe like here, six of us in the company at that time. We bought a case of beer. We locked ourselves in a conference room and we just started brainstorming names. And uh, Snap, we came up with as like a, a camera, like a photo, yep. like a snap of a camera. And a sheet is um, uh, it's a slang the word always, for an estimate. Yep. Yeah, for an estimate in insurance, you know, at a body shop. Um, so we just put together and snap sheet and and here you we, go. We, we we made a decision and we move forward. Obviously, it's working, and you did a great job. And it's funny because that, that I mean, when I saw Snapsheet, it made sense to me immediately. Just being a person that yeah. remembered meeting the guys, it has not been sheet. a difficult concept to grasp for carriers, but it's definitely a lot more difficult to I, implement but I do, at these like big organizations. That, and I also think like the the not to say common, but the common person doesn't realize. I don't think a person realizes how much went into this. Oh, yeah. Now, like now, yes, but like before, it, I think you just thought like Joe came out. Joe wrote on the sheet, circled a picture of my car. Joe right. sent it to the. Whatever, and I got my money, or I didn't most of the time. Get my money back. Right. You know, I don't think they realize how much goes into it, how many moving parts. And, right. And, it's like and when, when we go talk to carriers, we we discuss it as like it's a black box. Like you have absolutely no idea what's happening when an estimator adjuster is actually at your house, or when someone's at a body yeah. shop. You'll know what's going on. So like the software we've built uh, literally tracks every step of the process and what everyone's doing. Um, and by centralizing estimators, you know exactly how accurate they are, like per user. So you can really like fine tune and and write as accurate estimates as possible. So I want to kind of tap. You brought this up, and I want to kind of tap into you a little bit on this. So uh, you mentioned as a person, not you know, I'm, I'm humble enough to understand and want to solve my own problems and solve problems, um, but also as a person who leads a company and, and leads venture rounds and has to deal with, you know, for anyone out there who's not raised capital. It's great. You get money, but you also just got like 52 opinions. And yeah. and now like it's really 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 difficult it's, it's to It's annoying. Juggle. Yeah. I mean, to be totally honest, like yeah. it, it's helpful when it's helpful and they there's not to say that all investors are this way because they're not, but you get different expectations and they're using different metrics that are different from yours and it's just kind of a pain. So I I've noticed a trend along with myself, but also in a lot of the entrepreneurs we've had on the show is that there's this kind of walking a fine line between complete and utter indifference to like anybody's opinion about whatever I just did. And then also like taking every opinion that I hear and sort of in my own way, I guess, internalizing it. Yep. And so I, I feel like I would love to know on your side, you, you talked about how the fact that you're humble enough to know that you want to solve your own problems, but I assume that there's got to be a stubborn streak in you somewhere. Yes, there is. I mean, I think it's really important that a lot of founders underestimate is who you take money from. So yeah. like you really, what we found is you really, really want to do your homework and make sure that your interests align in like your vision of the company and where you're taking it <clears throat> and, and yourself. Because if you're, you know, if you're starting a service company and you're bringing on software investors, they're going to expect you to build software and, and vice versa. And so um, I think that's, that's really important to do your homework and, and, and call other portfolio companies and make sure that. Uh, from that investor and make sure that, that, that you really do align on the future vision of the company. And then like, you're always going to get different opinions <clears throat> and you just have to, like the way I've done it is, you know, you, you take them all very seriously, but in the end, like it's your company, it's your decision. It's also your ass. Yeah. So if you make the wrong decision, it's going to be known. Um, but you're pretty much betting on yourself. And I think most entrepreneurs would, you know, they're comfortable with that and they yeah. wouldn't be in the position that they're in if they weren't willing to take that risk. I agree. I think, I think also there's different layers. So like you, you talk about this and I, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it feels like you're talking about this in the sense of like the position and place you are today or in the last, call it two and a half years mm -hmm. where you're sort of, you know, you know what you're doing and this is, I got a pretty clear, as clear as it can be roadmap of what I'm trying to do. Um, the difference being in the, in the beginning, early stage rounds of money, if I'm taking in a million or more, okay, there's certain things that are going to change in the world as mm -hmm. I see it. When you're taking in 60, 70, 150, 200,000, my recommendation to all founders is leave a backdoor. 
Like if you if there's any way possible to get out of that or to buy out of that or to do whatever you got to do, be creative, try to keep an out because, like you said, you went through a pivot, a mm-hmm. major pivot. And if you left, you know, a certain amount of percentage of and the I, company, and there were a lot of challenges with going through the pivot, with even positioning that to my board. I bet is you know I was doing a lot of things behind the scenes and not letting them know what was happening, and I had investors but that, you that, had that to, came though. into a B2C company, and I was changing it to a B2B company where you've got much longer sales cycles, you've got you need a lot more capital to to give you like the runway to get there, and it was, and I didn't position it as well as I could, and it was it, it, it could have been almost like deadly for the company. Yeah, and I mean I make the same mistake and i'm probably making it literally every day but like there's a certain and this is this is the the the, what they talk about the the ceo growing pains of like growing into like becoming a real leader and leading a real company that's scalable versus leading you know a hobby company is there's a big difference there's a huge difference and one of the things becomes and you've just gotta i mean either be good at it or you're not and it either works or it doesn't you've got to get to this uh, this point where you can look and go i know that while it, I understand it, but as an investor, your investors, I know that you have ulterior motives and agendas that, that, ma- that are important to you. You put money in me. I owe you something. But I also know that if I call you and I tell you that I'm going to do this, you're going to go apeshit for your own reasons, and you're going to prohibit me from doing what is best for me and the company. And so you have to like mine the trap of like, what is my legal obligation to keep you in the know of what I'm doing and what is like the best interest of everyone? And, and you might be wrong and then everything falls apart, but that's the risk. That is the risk, yeah. And, and so like at your level now, I mean, not that it ever changes, it just becomes more complicated if, if not anything else. But in the early stages, I think the lesson to take away from this conversation, hopefully you agree, if not, like I said, obviously say whatever you want, but uh, I feel like a lot of this, the early companies try to come in and act like, you know, wearing big dad shoes and they come in like they're running like a big company and they get cocky and they take on every dollar because they just want to rake in that cash and they forget that, you know, you could be smart and make sure that you leave outs for yourself and that you act the size you are until you're another size of that. Yeah. I, that I mean, there's a certain, there's a certain amount of fake it till you make it yeah. that you kind of have to have if you want to sell into big you know, larger organizations. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you, I mean, you should definitely always be humble and, um, never and, say and, no and, to put someone's like opinion or advice. It's just, yeah, ever know when to know when to like also let that also run, run right. out. You know, yeah, I absolutely agree. Very cool. Uh, so before we kind of head out of here, obviously I want you to make sure you plug uh snapsheet and where people can go to learn more about it. Uh, what are some of the other things you're working on in the community? I know you're you're obviously active in all kinds of stuff, and I see your picture. What are the yeah, stuff? Yeah, I mean, in? I, I'm definitely trying to get more active. I want to, you know, spend more time at 1871, maybe teach some classes at Northwestern. But, um, you know, just just are you more. a Cats guy also? Uh, are you a Northwestern guy? No. Oh, okay, no, never mind. Yeah. Why do you want to teach Northwestern? We're not Chicago. Because I, I've taught there before. So oh, yeah. all right. Oh, that's why. I think I saw that, that you yeah. that you taught there before. Yeah. We're all, everyone in the room here is a Northwestern guy, so they're all like, oh, yeah. this is sweet. Cool. Uh, awesome. Well, where do people uh, go to learn more about Snapsheet? Uh, you more go about to uh, uh, snapsheet.me. Is it snapsheet.me? Yeah. yeah. Sweet. And don't you want to give out your personal email and your, your <laughs> cell phone or anything <laughs> no. like that? And is, Any startup places that they can they can find you to ask for money or any, any, <laughs> no. any other ideas? I think we're good on cash right now. I so. think we're good? Yeah, okay, thank you. Cool. Uh, Brad, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been awesome. Yeah, thank you. Of course. You can watch this episode of more at technori.com, download the podcast on iTunes, stay connected by following us on Facebook and Twitter at Technori, or follow me at Katoon. Boom, that's a wrap. <laughs>